Thank you. So today I will be talking about some experience on how to select gene and variants that are disease causing in Mendelian disease patients, and some of the methods that we use in uh, as part of the Genomics England 100,000 Genomes Initiative for the first 2,000 cases or so. So, in in the in the subject of clinical variant interpretation and reporting for diagnostics, there's a number of challenges that we need to overcome when we're using whole genome sequencing for that. And, and we're using whole genome sequencing because we have information that we believe that it will get into higher diagnostic rates. Nevertheless, we have, at the, end, at the beginning of this, we have too many variants. So the challenge is how do we find the variants that are relevant to the disease or, or the phenotype of the patient in a, in a quick and fast way? Uh, and how do we do this such that we optimize the time of the clinician that needs to look at those variants in order to make a classification and issue a report uh, in a way that is reproducible and fast, because this is the, the more cost effect, most costly part of the process. It's not only the sequencing, the clinician time costs a lot of money. And, and so, importantly, how to do this at scale when we are really starting to look into large number of patients. And the traditional way to do this is kind of the funnel, right? We know that the machines produce the, the sequencing reads. Uh, the analysis of that is done in the instruments, is what we call primary analysis. We normally don't get involved into that. Then there is the secondary data analysis where those reads are converted into variants by doing alignment and variant calling. But what I mean, I'm, I'm focusing right, right now is on the tertiary part. How do we interpret those variants? How do we annotate them and eventually create reports that can be shared with the doctor and the patient? And as, as I said, the traditional approach is a funnel approach where we start with, say, five million variants, and we start to reduce those in ways that we focus in the most relevant variants. And, and an easy way to do that is, let's say, anything that is non-coding, just get rid of it because we don't know how to interpret it today. So you can easily reduce that to 50,000 variants, for example. And then you can say, well, let's look at the consequence of these variants in the genes, and we only keep those that are more likely to be deleterious to the variants. For example, we can eliminate synonymous variants because they don't produce amino acid changes as long as they are not in splice sites, for example. And then you, you get down to maybe um, a couple thousand, 10,000, and, and eventually you will also filter by my uh, lead frequencies. Now there are lead frequency resources, and you will reason if it is a rare genetic disease, this variant cannot be common in the population, let's get rid of those. And so you may end up with hundreds of variants at the end of this process that they still need to be looked into uh, to make sure that they are, one of them is the disease causing. But the problem of this approach is that all of these filters are arbitrary, and they are made in different thresholds by different people, and sometimes you could get rid of the variant that is causal, or other times, if you try to be conservative, then you end up having hundreds of genes that need to be analyzed, and that, that could mean hours or even days on looking into a case. What we propose, and we've been doing that for some time, is an alternative approach, what we call ranking or prioritization, which basically means to use algorithms to prioritize variants with respect to the likelihood that they are relevant to the phenotype and the disease of the patient, such as the top variants in this list are more likely to be the cause of the variants, so that the clinician can start from the top, going to the bottom, and maybe just limit the study to say the top 20, and, and that way manage the cost and the time that the clinician is taking. So obviously our hope is that we need to use methods that they truly bring the variance to the top, and in that way we don't need to make any compromises. We can consider in this process mode of inheritance, for example, dominant, recessive, and if there is pedigree information, for example, the parents have been sequenced, we could also use that information at this step. And, and what I'm going to be talking today is that we can also use the phenotype information uh, to inform this process in a, in a joint way. So the, the methods that we've been using uh, is a part of a set of methods that uh, Mark and Dale and the University of Utah have been published over the years. The first one is this BAS, Variant Annotation and Analysis Tool, that is basically a composite likelihood ratio test that is stating the hypothesis that the variant is either uh, benign or is pathogenic. 
and the, the, the equation, the element uh, of the equation has several components. One of the ones that are really important is what are the characteristics of the frequency of the benign variance in a set of control samples, for example, you can use a thousand genomes for that, with respect to variants that are known to be disease, for example, in databases like CleanBar or HDMD or OMI. And, and then when, when you do this at the single variant level, is what we uh, now call the vast variant prioritizing, which is a score on its own uh, right, that it just tells about the probability that that variant is disease causing, and it's uh, scored on the percentile, so that it takes into account that some genes are more mutated than other, uh, than other genes, and so that they get normalized. And uh, in the last iteration of this uh, score, now we are also using a uh, leaf frequency as, an, as, a, as a part of the component of the score from NOMAD database. So we are leveraging these large-scale resources of uh, leaf frequency information. Uh, and when the variants are non-coding, we could use uh, evolutionary conservation, for example, from algorithms like FASTCONS. But then BAS goes a, a, a step further and performs a burden test at the gene level. And this is important because sometimes these diseases are recessive, so there may be two variants in the two haplotypes that are relevant for the disease. So it picks the, uh, when it's doing this in recessive mode, it will pick the two variants with the highest score. They are likely to be deleterious and test whether this uh, provide a score about the likely that the gene, in this case, not only the variant, is relevant to the disease. And the scores are somewhat arbitrary, so what, what we do really is to calculate p-values about what the likelihood that this score is present in a healthy population. And again, this is done by permutation, by replacement, using the, the genotypes from the 1,000 genome population. Just, just a little bit of information of BBP. BBP, this uh, score actually was published very recently. Uh, previously, we used a more simple score, but you can see here how it performs just to predicting the deleteriousness of pathogenicity with uh, respect to a uh, database of, of, va of pathogenic variants from CleanBar. These are three stars or, or above, meaning that they are highly confident to be pathogenic. And so you can see here rock curves of BVP as compared with SIFT and CAT performing very good. And another nice property of BVP is that it can score non-coding variants. So SIF cannot do it, CAD doesn't do it that well. So this is just a component of the score. It goes all the burden test. So, so far we have only considered variants and elite frequencies. Um, but patient penotypes are really big clues in, in trying to decipher uh, whether a variant or a gene is relevant. So how we can use them in a, in a more probabilistic fashion rather than just by looking at the variants and checking the phenotypes. And this is the subject of another algorithm called FIBER. Uh, and FIBER basically takes the past p-values, which can be used to rank variants, and test uh, in a vase naive, a naive vase um, test, uh, considering also a phenotype prior. And it's just testing two models, the model that the variant is, and the gene actually in this case this are related to disease, or the null model, and the ratio of these two. So how do we come up with this phenotype prior? And that's where we can leverage prior information, and if we get the phenotypes in HPO terms, you could argue we can just go to the HPO, see what are the genes that are associated with this term, and we could use those to create um, phenotypes. The problem is that our knowledge is incomplete, so in order to cover for that, um, FIBER uses um, a Bayesian belief mod model to seed the, the initial set of priors on the genes that are known for at that particular term. For example, we have here three terms, and they have three nodes in the, in the ontology of HPO that have been associated with a list of genes. But we know those list of genes are not complete. So what we do is that we do a propagation through the network in a way that as we go farther from the original nodes, the probability is reduced by half, but if they converge, they multiply, and that way we are kind of leveraging the latent knowledge of these ontologies to, to be able to compensate for lacks in our knowledge. And not only that, we could also project these terms into the Go ontology and leverage some information and this turned out to be quite useful in particular when we know very little about the function or the phenotypes that are responsible for, uh, for some of these um, um, 
diseases with respect to genes. Now, does this work, right? So what I'm gonna show you here is some of the data that we collected in the 1,000 genomes, uh, sorry, in the 100,000 genomes project as part of being one of the providers in genomics England. And as you may know, this project is trying to sequence 100,000 people as part of the healthcare, so half of those genomes are rare genetic diseases. And uh, to do that, we have provided the, 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 the Genomics England our decision support system that basically is a cloud-based solution that encompasses a lot of the annotations that you would like to do in this process, but also embeds within the interface BBP, BAS, and Fever, and so we can use the phenotype information uh, that they provide as part of the process. At the same time, the software also provides support to comply with the ACMG CAP guidelines, which are a complex set of guidelines that needs to be fulfilled in order to create a report. So our pipeline in, within the product is take the BCFs, do some normalization and clean up to make sure that, you know, indices are left aligned, things like that, sometimes they are not. Uh, do variant annotation, uh, calculate the BB, BBP score for every gene, and then they do the burden test at every gene using um, the vast background to, create, to calculate by permutation p-values. That gives us a ranking based on VAS. Then we can use the HPO terms uh, and the fever that are provi uh, the HPO term provided and fever to, um, to give the ranking that then we can also use based on the phenotype. And all this is providing the UI interface where you can see here, for example, uh, a, a diagnostic report where fever, that's the variant that fever thinks is number one, and BAST, because they have phenotype information, thinks is number eight, and, and there's a UI that allows the clinician to fulfill all the all of the requirements for the guidelines. Now, when we were doing Genomics England, the way it works is that they basically recruit the patients from the clinics, they obtain the DNA, they obtain phenotype and information and pedigree, sometimes they're sparring, and, and eventually they send to us an interpretation request with the BCF. But one of the things that they wanted to do from the beginning is to tier variants into different tiers. And the, the way they wanted to do this is, you know, we, let's tier the variants in, in terms of as, as current knowledge. And the idea was to crowdsource knowledge about potential diseases that this individual may have and see what are the genes that we are confidently related to this disease, which ones are less confidently, with, which ones are just one paper. And they have this green, amber, right, a red system to do that, and they basically only, only wanted to report green, the confident variants. And then they also tier the variants with respect to the type, if it's a, a loss of function or they are missense. So this complicated system was to try to kind of reduce the complexity, but it's kind of a parallel system that what we were proposing. So let's see how they compare. Uh, so the idea is that the interpretation request comes to us, and eventually there is a team that we provide of do clinical interpretation and to manage costs, they only have two hours to look at each case. And in these two hours, they do three protocols. One, they use fever, the top 20 from fever. Two, they may also look at clean bar, and if there is a low-hanging fruit, clean bar annotated, they can just right away use that. That may be a 10 minutes interpretation. Uh, and they use the tiers from Genomics England. So um, there is about 2,400 cases we have processed at this time. Most of these results come from about roughly 2,000, and in these two initial 2,000, about 49% of the cases we were able to return an interpretation, which is a pretty good diagnostic rate for ge rare genetic diseases, many of which were patients previously screened, but they failed to be diagnosed. And in this uh, graph, which shows show the different type of diseases, I'm not gonna go into detail, but the, the biggest bar in the bottom are neurodevelopmental diseases. They are very common. The second one, ophthalmological, some cardiovascular disease, and so on and so forth. And you can see what's the proportion. Some, some areas, the return of candidates is bigger than others, depending on our knowledge. But this is the key figure. So here we can see in this pie chart that the deep blue is the variants that were identified, the coastal variants that were identified by BAST and fever and by the tiering approach, but then in the, the, the green is the variants that were only identified by tiering approach, and in blue 
uh, light blue, the variants that were only identified by fever. So if we haven't done that additional step with algorithms, uh, the genetics England effort will be missing about 23% of the candidates. There is a gray area there. There are variants that they are clean bar, quickly interpreted by the expert clinicians. And so, and definitely, there is a gap for fever to cover. And I will talk a little bit about that, how we can improve that. But it clearly shows that these two um, effects uh, are complementary, but they are fever as significant value. Now, I also mentioned in some cases we have families, so in this graph you can see that having parent offspring, offspring trios, which is the light blue, significantly improves the ability to identify candidates. And in this graph, I just show you what are the ranks for the cases that we have identified candidate variants, about 450 provans in this, in this graph. What are the, the ranks of these variants in this uh, BAS or BAS plus fever, and you can see here that, for example, if we look at 20, which is what we allow our clinicians to look, uh, about you know close to 45% of the causative variants will have been found in their vast rank. But when we add fever and the information from the phenotype, we have a huge bump. So 75% of the cases have the variant already in the top 20, which means that the clinicians we'll find an answer just by looking at the top 20 from the 5 million variants, which is a pretty good result. And so what are the, the gaps? How we can improve will be some of the questions that we've been asking ourselves. Um, in conclusion, phenotype-driven uh, prioritization is very effective to rank disease genes and enables fast interpretation. Gene panels of tier systems are somewhat arbitrary, and they are kind of our limit of knowledge. Some mostly redundant, and add a little bit, but they miss causative variants. If that's the only way that is there is used to interpret genomes. And how do we close the gap to make fever even better? So there is a couple of problems that sometimes we have variants that have not been scored by BAS, and that's because the backgrounds that we're using thousand genome problem has uh, project has some gaps. So as we improve those backgrounds, we believe that's going to be a sole problem. There were some other bugs that we fixed. Um, the other thing is sometimes when we do compound heads, we have a problem because we pick the more deleterious and sometimes one of the bona fide um, pathogenic variants is not the, the most pathogenic one. And uh, negative phenotype is something we are implementing. And, and so a little things like that, that we are now deploying a new version of software that is going to Genomic England. And with that, I just want to acknowledge our collaborators and thank you for listening. It's just about the annotations you're using. You you, you mentioned mode of inheritance. Right. So are do you need this information for all the variants in the study? And if you do, then how do you get this information? Right. So no, so what, what what you do is that you can um, when you're doing vast and fever, you, you can do both dominant and recessive. So it's automatically calculated dominant and recessive, the mode of inheritance. And so when you're looking at the variants that are ranked, as a clinician, we'll, we'll see what's the, what's the phenotype, the disease that is associated with that gene, for example. In other words, in order to issue a report that says this is the cause of the variant, they will have to look at the literature and say it, it actually matches the phenotype and it matches the mode of inheritance. For example, if it's a dominant versus a recessive, they need to make sure that that literature support that is dominant and recessive. So, so the software just does automatically both so, uh, dominant and recessive, and you can pick as a clinician. There. Sorry, when you say auto automated, automatically calculated by what? By who? Who? Uh, by by the algorithm. Vast and fever calcul. Vast actually calculates the burden test. For example, if it's a dominant, you just look at one variant. If it's a recessive, you need to find either an homozygous for that variant, in other words, two copies, or a compound and heterozygous. So those are two models where the burden test can be calculated, and you can get both numbers, assuming it's dominant or assuming it's recessive. So you have to give that information to VAST? You can give it to, or, or it calculates both of them, and then you pick which one you think is more relevant for your disease. Okay, so thank you.
other questions? Okay, I think we have finished for today. So a few last things you want to... Okay, thanks again. To thanks.